Aloha, welcome back. We are in software analysis and design, and today we have our last little piece about domain analysis, about class models, and more specifically, the communication diagrams for class models. Before we jump into that, however, I have a slight excursion. Uh, I just want to check in with you for a moment because I care and because it seems that in a lot of areas of our life, we rarely get to talk about that. So how are you doing today? Mm, do you think you're gonna be able to focus on what we're doing here? Like just being present here, not multitasking, not trying to also deal with your email while we're doing this, not having some nice music in the background and humming along to, I don't know, which lovely music. Um, or if you get distracted, do you think that's because I'm doing a poor job or because you're not that great of a listener or maybe a little bit of both? Or is there really some other stuff underneath that is just capturing your attention and continuously pulling you away from what's going on in here? Because, you know, software design, yeah, it matters for wanting to develop the systems that we want to bring out into the world and hopefully improve something with them. If we are ourselves not in the right place because we are caught up in emotions or we have some thoughts circling in our heads that just keep coming back and pulling us away from what we're trying to focus on, then maybe maybe we need to pay attention to these emotions first. And research has shown us that our emotions, our mental and physical health are strongly connected with each other. And I listened to a podcast today, um, Brenny Brown, Brenny Brown's podcast, Unlocking Us, and she was interviewing Dr. Mark Brackett, who is a professor in psychology at Yale University. And he just recently published a book that's called Permission to Feel. And in that one, he explains really well what the connection is between our emotions, our physical and our mental health, and what effects that can have in, in your work life, in your private life, and how strongly that impacts performance in all areas of our life. And by performance, I don't only mean like really aiming for the peak, but just in general, how we function in our daily lives. And in the software engineering curriculum, I believe that often comes too short. We kind of talk about working in teams and how those soft skills are important. And maybe the name soft skills is not even the best name for it because it always makes them sound less important than the hard skills that we associate with some technological skills. I'm a firm believer in that emotional intelligence is a super important skill, maybe the most important one. And at the moment, you're likely to receive rather little exposure to that in, in learning software engineering. And for that, I would like to encourage you to maybe pick up that book, Permission to Feel, or another one of Bernie Brown's books, who's also a professor at Texas University in, in this area, and pick whatever helps you work a little bit on your emotional intelligence if that is an area that you have not worked on yet. I trust that it will very positively impact you in different areas of your life. But that's just me, that's a suggestion. So with that, let's move on into our topic for today. We have a couple of things to cover. We're first gonna talk about the assigned reading article, Data Driven Requirements Engineering by Walid Malay. Then look into UML communication diagrams. They are one type of interaction diagram. 
and then we'll look at a couple of examples and in the end I have an exercise for you. So data-driven RE. Uh, up on the top right you see a picture of Walid. Walid is a former um, colleague of mine from Technical University of Munich and in 2014 he was nominated as Nachwuchswissenschaftler, as you can clearly read on top of the slide, uh, that means junior researcher. So in 2014, he was nominated junior researcher in Germany, and uh, that's a little picture that I screenshot from YouTube. There we go. And he works in requirements engineering, he researches in requirements engineering, and a lot of that in data driven requirements engineering. He argues in his article that developers, requirements analysts, and managers could systematically use explicit and implicit user feedback in an aggregated form to support requirements decisions. The goal is data-driven requirements engineering by the masses and for the masses. So what does that mean? He says, in app stores where a lot of people leave reviews for apps, we get a very high number of users willingly uh, giving input on uh, requirements, on features they would like to have, on features they don't like, and uh, suggestions for improvement. And if our user base is really large to bring the input for that, that means if we develop our products accordingly, then we are likely to also satisfy a very large percentage of our users. So software product success often depends on user feedback. And as large portions of software are delivered and used through app stores, more of that feedback from the user becomes available from masses of users. And then Walid and colleagues discuss in their article how software developers and analysts can use this data to identify, prioritize, and manage the requirements for their software products. One of the ways of how they do that is in that bubble on the bottom right. So feedback describing user experiences can serve as ad hoc documentation on one hand, and then it can also serve to derive user stories and maybe to derive improved user stories. Now, you may ask, excuse me, aren't we in a uh, software design course, why, why are we talking about requirements engineering again? Well, if you look at that figure on the left that is taken about some Dropbox features and some feature-based uh, user feedback summaries for Dropbox, you will see, huh, what are people doing most? Apparently, sharing photos, taking photos, deleting photos, uploading photos a lot more than the other features. So the impact on design could be that some of the feedback describing user experiences also describes workarounds and unusual situations that could inspire designers to develop test cases, capture exceptions and alternate flows and design new features. Because as you can see in that graphic, upload photo is the most liked feature, super easy, Deleting a photo seems to be a bit of a hassle. It has a negative sentiment connotated with it. And so this may inspire the designers to maybe change that feature to make it easier for people to delete photos. So that is one way of how this can impact design. And in general, having this kind of aggregated feedback from users is just gonna help development become a little more agile move a little more smoothly from aggregated user feedback to improved design. And with that, uh, let's get to today's design habit. Experts generate alternatives. So from these alternate workflows that can be identified from user feedback, that is one example for generating alternatives we can also in our forward engineering always develop a couple of alternatives before we take a final design choice 
as you can clearly see in the little balloon that is being used on the left to, the, to generate these design alternatives, the shapes that come out of that one single balloon are significantly different from each other. So experts explicitly seek, develop, and evaluate alternatives through design. They do this at all levels. By probing these alternatives, even just in their minds, they maintain as much flexibility in the design solution as possible. And alternatives make explicit where and how design might be able to give in the face of future decisions. So if all of the designs to the left fulfill a specification, maybe specification was it has four legs, it has a head, it has a tail. All those different figures still fulfill that. And then we can start arguing about quality criteria. Some of these creatures may be able to run faster than others. Uh, some of them may be able to jump higher than others. Um, some of them may be able to sneak in somewhere unseen. I know this is fairly abstract for a characteristic of a software system, but you get the idea. So we have additional quality attributes that we can then look at for these alternative designs and decide which ones are the most important ones. Keep that in mind for the assignments that come up at the end. Here we get to uh, the UML diagram type overview. So um, I mentioned we'll work with a new diagram type today, the communication diagram. And the communication diagram is one of the interaction diagrams along with the sequence diagram that we'll look at in, in a couple of weeks, the interaction overview diagram and the timing diagram. Now all these interaction diagrams are amongst the behavioral diagrams along with activity diagrams, use case diagrams and state machine diagrams. In addition to behavioral diagrams, we also have structural diagrams. We have composite structure diagrams, deployment diagrams, package diagrams, profile diagrams, object diagrams, component diagrams, and last but not least, class diagrams, which are the ones that we talked about in the last lecture. So class diagram is a structural view on something, and the communication diagram that we'll look at today is one interaction view that can depict behavior. Communication diagrams are in UML like sequence diagrams. They are a kind of interaction. They show how objects interact. It's the extension of an object diagram that shows the objects along with the messages that travel from one to another. In addition to the association among objects, communication diagrams show the messages that the objects send to each other. Visual Paradigm has a good page on that. You find the reference at the bottom. I have also taken a couple of examples from, from their page. But first, the purpose. So what's the purpose of a communication diagram? It models the messages passing between objects or roles that deliver the functionality of use cases and operations. It also models mechanisms within the architectural design of the system. It captures interactions that show the past messages between objects and roles within the collaboration scenario. It also models alternative scenarios within use cases or operations that involve the collaboration of different objects and interactions. And last but not least, it supports the identification of objects, hence classes, and their attributes, which are the parameters of messages, and the operations, the messages, that participate in the use cases. So we use communication diagrams to depict the flow of objects that support a use case. And here is an example that explains the notation. So we have as a diagram kind interaction. You see that marked in the top left in the frame. Then we have the frame heading and we have the name of owning element or enclosing namespace and that is online bookshop. You have the diagram frame on the outside that delimits the diagram and then you have an actor on the very left. This actor has a lifeline and then there is a sequence expression. 
one star. So this is the first element in the sequence and the iteration, that's the star. So the actor wants to find books in the online bookshop and then number two wants to check them out. Those are the two things that they can do. You go search for books and you go to check out. Now for sequence one, that starts with find books and book find books includes the message search, then a search is performed in the inventory. Then in case interested, if interested, that's a guard. If interested, the actor can view the book. And for that, we access the object book. The book, because it's a specific book, has a lifeline name. You see how the inventory on top did not have a lifeline name because there is only one, one inventory in our online bookshop. B, the book, the specific book that we're looking at, does have a lifeline name because it's one specific instance. And then the class name is book. So that's another lifeline. And then uh, sequence step 1.3 is, well, if we're deciding to buy the book, then we're gonna add it to the cart. So we have a selector that says the shopping cart of this specific customer. So there's another lifeline, the instance of the shopping cart of that specific customer. Now it's added to the cart. Perfect. Good. That's it with sequence one. And then sequence two is the checkout sequence. So 2.1, get books in the shopping cart. 2.2, there is a sequence expression that says, if the cart is not empty, turn that into an order. So in case our shopping cart was empty and we click on checkout, then it's going to give us a message back saying, you got nothing to check out, your shopping cart is empty. If it's not empty, then we can make an order, it creates an order. So there's another lifeline for order. And then um, 2.3, if the order is complete or when the order is complete, we're going to update the inventory. And that's it with the checkout. In this one, the payment is not modeled. So with that step, we're done. And with that, you already have all the most important elements for the notation of a communication diagram. A little repeat, the lifelines and the messages, those are your most important elements. So on top, you see the user and there is an anonymous lifeline and then you have a lifeline data of the class stock. And at the bottom, you have a lifeline X of a class X that is selected with a selector K. What was the example in the online bookshop? The shopping cart, the SC of the customer of the type shopping cart, yes. And then on the right, you see um, the generic example for a message. So an instance of class A sends the message remove to an instance of B if S1 is equal to S2. So a little bit of pseudocode. It's the random step 1.2.4. And it says in the guard, if S1 equals S2, and in that case, we're gonna remove. We don't know what we're removing because there is no parameter in that method. For most of the removals that you'd be doing, we may know that we may have more specifics. Or A is removing B. This is where we can get creative in our interpretations and that's why it's so important that you describe all your diagrams. Good, second example. Thank you to Mr. Scott Ambler, who has the site agilemodeling.com. He had a couple of really well explained diagrams, specifically this one diagram that I wanted to show you. So, it's a simplified collaboration diagram, dram, diagram for displaying a seminar details screen or page. The rectangles represent the various objects involved that make up the application. The lines between the classes represent the relationships that can be associations, composition, dependencies, or inheritance between them. And and then you see that uh, from the seminar details, we can 
request a couple of details from the object seminar. And then there is substats, substeps. So we can get the name or number of a specific course, we can get a description, and we can enroll in the seminar. And for that enrollment, there are a couple of get info steps that get thrown forward uh, and broken down into get full name and get some of the other details of that particular student. So there is a series of getter invocations. Get info invokes get info invokes get full name. And the message notation at the bottom, same, same as on the previous slide, just described slightly differently. And for some people, this is easier to understand. So at the beginning, you have the sequence number, and then you have the method name, the parameters, and then you have the return value at the end. So see how on the right-hand side, you have get name, and then the return value is a string. And on the left, it's not specified because you wanted to show both of uh, the options to do that. So the seminar details user interface object collaborates with the seminar object to obtain the information needed to display the information. It first invokes the getter method to obtain the name of the seminar. And to fulfill that responsibility, the seminar object collaborates with the course object that describes it to obtain the name of the course. And uh, Scott showed the return values for some of the messages, but not for others to provide examples for how to do both. He either indicates the type of the return value, for example, a string, or the result, such as seminar name uh, in the very first one. If you look at one, get name, seminar name is what gets returned. And remember that all those messages, they map to operations implemented by your classes, which means there is a consistency thing here going on. The messages you see in the communication diagram should show up as methods in your class diagram. And you draw communication diagrams in the same way as you draw sequence diagrams. Here's, here's where it gets really interesting because that's gonna save you a ton of work as we get to sequence diagrams a bit down the road. The only real difference is that you lay out the notation in a different manner. And Scott Amber rarely finds the need to create communication diagrams, although he has found them useful in situations where he didn't have use cases as primary requirements artifacts, which is exactly the case that we're gonna have for the assignment um, for this module. Now, what are they good for, these interaction diagram types? The same notation for classes and objects used on UML sequence diagrams is also used on UML communication diagrams. That is another example of the consistency of the unified modeling language. The details of your associations, such as their multiplicities, are not modeled. Why? Because this information is contained in your UML class diagrams, so no need to duplicate that. Remember that each UML diagram has its own specific purpose. No single diagram is sufficient on its own because if we have a structural diagram, we don't know what the behavior is and the other way around. Messages are depicted as a labeled arrow that indicates the direction of the message using a notation similar to that used on sequence diagrams. So you'll see that notation again. And you already know a lot for it. So the question is who takes care of the consistency in UML models? You. We'll get back to that in a little bit of how that can be supported. First, however, another example for a hotel reservation. So each message has a sequence number. As we break down a sequence into substeps, we go to lower levels. So the top level message is number one. And then messages sent during the same call have the same decimal prefix, but suffixes of one, two, et cetera, according to when they occur. So from one, we go to 1.1, 1 .1, we go to 111, 1112 is room, and then 11121 breaks it down further. And sorry, from 111, we go to 1111, and then to 1112. You get the point, we follow the numbers. And the further it goes down into the hierarchy, 
the longer our number sequence becomes. And then we'll make our way back up. Last example here, a library item. And this is to show to you when, which type of diagram is more useful. So we have a librarian that uh, inquires about a borrower. And then uh, the user interface uh, will display the transactions that a certain borrower has and create a fine in case there is an overdue media medium. So communication diagrams are useful for visualizing the relationship between the objects collaborating to perform a particular task, especially if you don't have use cases. And they can also help you determine the accuracy of your static model. That is class diagrams. Now, what would happen if I wanted to know the time sequence, how these steps take place? Well, in that case, I would use a sequence diagram. And now if you compare those two diagrams, the communication diagram on the slide before and the sequence diagram on the slide, you'll see that they both contain objects and messages. It becomes clear that it's much easier to determine the time order of the messages by looking at the sequence diagram. And it's easier to see the relationships between the objects by looking at the communication diagram before this one. So that's the main difference. Relationships between objects, communication diagram, timing, sequence diagram. Got it. What if I told you consistency is success? So let's come back to that consistency thing. I asked you a couple of slides ago, who needs to take care of the consistency of the UML diagrams? Yes, the modeler, you. That said, there are tools that can help you with that. And we haven't talked about tools yet. There is a multitude of tools available and I am not on top of all of them. I know more tools than have their icons on the slide and I'm not, um, not advertising for any particular tools. These are just a couple of examples. You have two general options. One is to use a drawing tool that has some UML stencils. So that gives you the, the notation to draw a UML diagram, but no semantics behind it. What does that mean? That means you use draw.io or umlet or omnigraphel to create something that looks like a diagram, but that does not have a model behind it. That means if I create another diagram, those two diagrams are independent of each other. That's one way. The other way is to use a case tool. Case stands for computer aided software engineering, and that means behind two diagrams that belong to the same project, I will have one model. And that means my diagrams will stay consistent with each other. So if I model the class diagram and then I model a object diagram that, uh, sorry, a communication diagram that belongs to that same project, I will get flagged for inconsistencies. And depending on how well the tool is implemented, the tool may be better or not so great at flagging those inconsistencies, but ideally, it would show you if you try to create something that does not work with the model that you have in the background. So for example, in your communication diagram, if you base that off your class diagram and you put two objects there, the librarian and the inventory, and you try to draw a line from the librarian to the inventory, that does not exist as a relationship in your class diagram, then you would get flagged by the tool. Now, from an educator perspective, um, I would of course say, well, go ahead and use some drawing tools because that way you have to think about the consistency and I want you to do that in your head. And, and yes, I do want you to think about the consistency. And as we go further down the road, and as soon as you're 
mm, diagrams and systems become slightly more complex, it's just going to be really hard to keep all those relationships in your head and have that consistency taken care of manually. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense to go explore those case tools where part of the consistency is being taken care of for you. And it's your call with which of the uh, products you go with. There is a couple of them that provide free community editions, especially for students. Um, Argo UML, which is the one with the paper boats, uh, and then Poseidon and Story UML. All of those are definitely freely available. And some of the proprietary tools on the left, they also have community editions or education uh, editions available. So go, go check them out and then see what works best for you. That just as a little side note. And with that, we get to the exercise. So for today, I would like you to get back to the class diagrams that you made after the last lecture. There are two. One is from Forward Engineering, uh, a class diagram for the amusement park entrance ticketing system. And the other one is from reverse engineering from a open source or own project object oriented code. So for both of those class diagrams, I would like you to develop a collaboration diagram modeling one main use case for that system. That's it. One main use case, that means you take the objects that are part of the use case, you bring them into the right order, you connect them with the methods that are also in your class diagram. And if they were not, you now have to think about them and think about which methods you're gonna to need to connect the objects to do the thing that you want them to do in your use case. And remember, the design habit, experts generate alternatives. So think about which alternatives you have, especially if you realize, oh, I actually didn't implement all the methods yet. So what are the different ways of how communication could happen in between the classes that you have already modeled? Important differentiation here on, uh, in that last lecture module, we talked about domain modeling. So the forward engineering domain modeling that takes into account the classes that get represented from real world objects into the software system. When you go reverse engineering or when you go into system design class diagrams, then you will also have the classes that are only visible internally in the system. So domain modeling, model the elements around the system that need to be represented in the system, but the system itself is still black box and we don't know what's happening inside. In reverse engineering or taking a white box approach to systems design, that means we can look into that black box. All of a sudden, it's not only user interacting with black box, it's we see, oh, there's a model, there's a view, and there's a controller in that now white box that we can see into. So as you move forward into that white box and you see which elements you need to realize that system, you have more design alternatives that you can play with. Going back to the example from the library, all of a sudden you have to decide, well, can the librarian interact directly with the inventory or is there a central controller that the librarian can ask and that will then get from the inventory whatever it needs to get? Is there a kind of manager for these different types of requests? Is there a broker that takes care of these things or can those objects interact directly? So that's how your design alternatives come into play. And if you're not quite sure what other alternatives you could use for your design, go look into design patterns Design patterns have been around for a couple of decades in software engineering. There is a famous book on design patterns written by the so-called Gang of Four under the lead of uh, Eric Gamma. And that is highly commended, highly recommended to look into. It's on our reading list. And with that, 
I, I hope you have fun exploring these different design options. Take a look at those communication diagrams. Let me know what works for you. Reread Walid's article if you just glossed over it and consider looking into Dr. Mark Brackett's book and the podcast that I recommended at the beginning of the lecture. Let me know what you think. Leave your comments and questions and I look forward to seeing you soon.